Audio 11.1. Question 1. Africa is home to more languages than any other continent. At the present time, there are about 1,300 languages spoken by over 400 million speakers. There are four main language groups and various lingua francas, languages used for communication between people from different language groups across a wide area. Question 2. The Bow Wow theory states that language is based on imitation, that when language began, Our ancestors imitated natural sounds around them, such as animal noises. However, critics say this is unlikely, as while in English children describe a dog's call as bow wow, in China, for example, they call it wang wang. The Yo He Ho theory says that language evolved from the noises people make while using extreme physical effort. However, as linguists point out, This doesn't account for all the other words in our vocabulary. As yet, no linguists have described the bang bang theory. Question 3. The answer's logical. It's generally agreed that despite the fact that the brain was increasing in size, early humans didn't start using tools extensively until they started communicating using speech. The reason for this is that until this time, They couldn't use tools because their hands were being used for communicating in gestures. Question 4. Chimpanzees certainly don't have the intellect that humans do, but experiments have shown that they can be trained to work out logical connections and, in the right environment, acquire a vocabulary of up to 200 items. However, efforts to get chimps to speak have been a total failure. The reason they cannot speak is simple. Their bodies are not designed for speech. Question 5. By the age of 18, the average person has a vocabulary of some 60,000 words. This means he or she must have learned an average of 10 new words every day, about one word every 90 minutes. Question 6. The Fino Ugric languages are a group of languages which are alike in some respects and share common roots. They're spoken in the north of Europe in Finland, Estonia, and parts of northern Sweden, and in one country in Central Europe, Hungary. Audio 11.2 One. Can you think of a food which reminds you of your childhood? 2. Is there any ingredient you really don't like? 3. What foreign restaurants are popular where you live? 4. Which is the best region in your country in terms of food? 5. What's the best type of street food in your country? Audio 11.3. Whoever thought of taking day old tortillas, frying them, and serving them with melted cheese, chilies, and tomato sauce? The answer is Nacho, or to give him his full name, Ignacio Anaya. The story goes that a group of women, the wives of US servicemen, walked into a restaurant in northern Mexico. It was the end of the day. And Nacho threw together a meal with the ingredients he had to hand. The customers were delighted, and Nachos, as they became known, were quickly exported over the border into the United States. It just goes to show that no matter what ingredients you have, a tasty snack can be made. Who invented the kebab? It seems whoever you ask, they'll tell you a different story. From Greece to Iran, Turkey to India, everyone is claiming responsibility. However, it does seem likely that the kebab started out as a food for soldiers. While on duty, they would put meat on their swords and grill it over an open fire. Many kebabs today are still cooked horizontally on a metal skewer. However, the modern doner kebab, in which the meat is cooked vertically, 
is generally agreed to have been invented by Iskender Effendi of Borsa, Turkey. Whichever direction you have your meat cooked, it's sure to be delicious. Pad Thai is arguably the most famous dish to come out of Thailand. A simple dish of rice noodles and meat and vegetables, it's the dish that Thai restaurants around the world are judged on. In Thailand itself, you can find it in every cafe and street stall. Surprisingly, though, the origins of this national dish don't go back that far. Before the 1940s, Pad Thai didn't really exist. It was the Prime Minister of the time who popularised the dish in an effort to promote national unity and advance the country's economy and health. The recipe was rolled out across the country and street vendors were encouraged to make and sell it. It's not known who invented the recipe, although it has strong Chinese influences. Whoever invented it, though, it has undeniably become the national dish of Thailand in a relatively short period of time. Paella was originally an easy lunch dish for farm workers to cook in the fields near Valencia, Spain. Whenever I think of paella, I think of seafood, but this was not one of the original ingredients. It was made with rice, plus anything else found in the surrounding countryside, tomatoes, onions and beans, with some snails, rabbit or whatever. Traditionally, it was shared and eaten straight from the pan. Later, the recipes were refined and seafood was added, and there are now some 200 paella recipes in the Valencia area alone, with many more varieties in other parts of Spain and abroad. Audio 11.4 Let me introduce my next guest, who is making us a classic Greek dish here in the studio. Eleni Papadakis. You run a small but enormously popular Greek restaurant in East London. And you've also written two Greek recipe books. That's right. And you're making us one of your signature dishes, moussaka. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So, tell me, are you following a traditional recipe? It's my version of it, but it's based on the traditional recipe. OK. So, tell us what you're doing. Well, I've already prepared the aubergine layer. I thinly sliced two aubergines, seasoned them with salt and pepper, and brushed them generously with olive oil. They're baking in the oven. What I'm making now is the meat layer. I've roughly chopped up some onions and softened them in oil, then I added garlic, cinnamon and oregano, and after that I stirred in the lamb. Then I added peeled tomatoes. You have to peel them as the skin goes bitter if you leave it in the sauce. Tomato puree and red wine. So, this now needs to cook gently for at least half an hour to reduce the liquid. Mmm, it smells delicious already. I know, it's good, isn't it? Anyway, now I need to make the white sauce for the top layer. So I'm melting the butter with some flour, and now I need to add some warm milk and beat it in. How do you avoid getting lumps? I just beat it vigorously so they don't have the chance to form. OK, that's done. Now, I've grated some pecorino cheese here, and I'm going to melt that into the white sauce. There you go. Now, this is what makes the white sauce special. I'm going to beat two eggs into it. The eggs make the sauce rise when it's cooked. It's almost like a custard. Yes, it goes nice and fluffy. And once the eggs are beaten in, I'll season it and add some grated nutmeg. So, Eleni, all three elements are now ready. What are you doing now? I'm putting layers of the aubergines and meat in an oven dish. There, that's done. And the final touch. The white sauce covers the whole thing. Then back into the oven for 45 minutes. Some people like to sprinkle cheese on top and grill it at the end. Do you do that? No, I add cheese to the sauce. I don't think it needs any more. Well, I can't wait to try it. What would you serve with your moussaka?
Audio 11.5. Okay, so the best street festival in Asia is without any doubt Songkran. No way should you miss this amazing party. Songkran is a major festival in Thailand. It's the celebration of the Thai New Year, and apart from anything else, it's the biggest water fight in the world. It takes place each year in April, which is the hottest time of the year. Originally, the date was determined by the lunar calendar, but now it takes place officially from the 13th to the 16th of April. Although the celebrations can go on for a whole week. Again, going back to its origins, it was a religious festival. And it was all to do with cleaning and making fresh starts. People would clean out their houses. They would clean religious statues, and very respectfully, they would pour water on their family and on their neighbours. Just a little water to symbolise the start of the new year. Now it's all become an absolutely massive street party. And it's totally fine and normal to soak complete strangers. The whole thing is designed to bring you good luck in the new year, and it's a huge party with dancing, drinking, and lots and lots of water. Thai people often go home to their villages, but for visitors, the place where you can have the best Songkran experience is Bangkok. It gets really busy though, so you do need to book accommodation well in advance. The city gets incredibly busy, and in terms of advice, well, be super careful with your cameras, your phones, and any other valuables because everything will get wet. While your actual room is probably safe. The staff may attack you elsewhere in the hotel. That's how serious it gets. Don't try and use public transport to get into the centre of town because it's just crazy. You must show respect for the religious elements of the ceremony, which are still there. And what you absolutely have to remember is this: don't come to Songkran without a bucket or a water pistol. Because you've got to fight back. Audio eleven point six. One. Now it takes place officially from the thirteenth to the sixteenth of April. Two. Thai people often go home to their villages. Three. While your actual room is probably safe. Audio eleven point seven. One. Now it takes place officially from the thirteenth to the sixteenth of April, although the celebrations can go on for a whole week. Two. Thai people often go home to their villages, but for visitors, the place where you can have the best Songkran experience is Bangkok. Three. While your actual room is probably safe, the staff may attack you elsewhere in the hotel. Audio eleven point eight. One. I'll never forget that holiday. Two. The architecture really impressed me. Three. I never thought about the danger we were in. Four. When I got back to the village, I stopped running. Five. The food was the best thing.